So we've come to a very pivotal point in the unfolding story um, of, in the universe. At this point, everything was pristine and perfect and perfect in every way. There was harmony and unity. Think about that. There was harmony and unity between God and mankind. God had richly, God had richly blessed them. He walked and he talked with them. The relationship was perfect. There was harmony and unity between Adam and Eve. The relationship was perfect in every, in every way. There was no secrets. Everything was, was perfect in that way, complete openness. There was complete harmony and unity between mankind and his environment. There was no fear. There was no sickness. There was no death. Everything was perfect in every way. There was complete harmony and unity between God and all the angels and the spirits. Um, they perfectly, the angels perfectly obeyed um, and followed the, wish, the wishes of God, obeying him and worshiping him. There was complete unity between mankind and the angels and the spirits as well. So all that God had done was to lead every part of his creation towards that was good, that which was good, blessing them beyond measure. Which of us wouldn't have wanted to live in that environment? And that's the truth. Which of us wouldn't have wanted to live in that environment? We all deal with, with so many different things, but it wasn't like that in the beginning. Now, please note, during creation, all of the angels worship God for all of his majesty and power. And at the end of the creation, God declared that everything was perfect, including Lucifer. And so as we understand God's word, we need to understand up to this point, everything was perfect. There was no brokenness. There was nothing falling. Everything was, was, was perfect in that way. But that was, a, that was about to change. And so God's word is going to reveal, first of all, Luf, Lucifer's attitude and then God's response to him. And so we're going to look at it in three points. Lucifer sinned against his owner by rejecting his rule. God alone stands as supreme. He will never give his glory to another. God in his absolute holiness is furious with all sin, so much that every sinner will be punished forever. So point number one, Lucifer sinned against his owner by rejecting his rule. So take your Bibles, and uh, we're going to have to flip a little bit uh, as we go through this. Um, Ezekiel chapter 28 is kind of in the middle of your Bible and over just a couple pages. Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's begin. Let's read verses uh, 14 and 15 for starters. You were the anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, uh, garden, uh, garden cherub, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in all your ways from the day that you were created. So as we looked at, so how was, how was Lucifer and all of the angels created in the beginning? How were they created? They were perfect, okay? How, and when we say they were perfect, what does that mean? Perfect in what way? Sinless, yes. How about their attitudes? Was there any wrong bad attitudes in anything that God asked them to do? Any wrong thinking? Any disobedience? No, they, they were created to worship God. So how did they look when they were created? They're perfect in every way. How else were they created? What's some of the characteristics that God instilled in them? It's important for us to, just to review. They were created perfect, but what else? What else did God instill in them? They needed God? Yes, what else? How else? What else did God instill within the angels when he created them? They were created for his purpose? Yep. What else? They were blameless? Yep. They were in subjection to God. They were under his authority. Okay? How, um, um, what kind of abilities did God give to them? What kind of abilities did God instill in them? To worship him? Yes, that's their response. But think about their abilities. What did God give them to do? What did they look like and how did they function? There were some limitations in what they could do. There were limitations in what way? Were they everywhere present at one time? No, they were only in one location at one time. Were they bound by the physical? No, they're not bound by the physical. They, they, were, they, were, crea they, were, created as, they were created as spirits. What about their intellect and their, what about their, intellect and their power? Their um, strength. They had no power to create. They had no power to create, yep. Yeah. But are, are they equal to us as mankind? No, so there are greater intellect, greater ability, but did they have our position? Did God create them at our position before God? No, we were created for the purpose of a relationship. Did the angels, were they created in the image of God for a purpose of relationship? No, they were, created, they were created underneath of that. But they also, remember, they also have the ability to choose. So let's keep reading to see Lucifer's uh, um, attitude, first of all, in verses 15 to 17. You were blameless in all your ways from the day that you were created until, uh, until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. 
You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. And so uh, what did Lucifer, what did Lucifer do? What did Lucifer do? He sinned. How did he sin? How did Lucifer sin? Sorry? He rebelled against God, sorry? He was filled with violence. What else? He exalted himself, yes. Lifted himself, lifted himself, lifted himself up in pride. He shook, he shook his fist at God. He had been made, he had, he, um, he had been honored by God with the highest position over the angels. He lived in the presence of the majesty of God. It says he walked amongst the stones of fire, walked amongst the angels. He lived around the throne. This should have humbled him. It should have caused him to choose and live in fellowship with his all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present, sovereign, sovereign Lord. And so how did God, how did God, and according to this passage, how did God view Lucifer's actions? How did he, what did, what did he call it? Pride, yes, what else? The last part of verse, last part of verse 15. Until what was found in you? Wickedness, what other versions? What are other words that are used in other versions? Iniquity, unrighteousness, and, um, and sin. As a result, what did God do? What did God do? He banished him. He cast him out of heaven. So let's go turn over, turn back over to um, Isaiah chapter 14, just to get a little bit further sense as to what this was all about. Isaiah chapter 14, one book backwards. Okay, we're getting into that. Just hold on to your horses. Where did that sin come from? Good question. Others have been asking that question too, I think. And um, so Isaiah chapter. Isaiah chapter 14. It may take, we'll get into the, sec, we'll get into the second point, but uh, we'll get there, so just hold on to that. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Can somebody read that for us, please? You said in your heart, I will ascend to you, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the uttermost heights of Mount Saphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Okay, so where did, where, did, where did Lucifer's pride lead him? Where did it lead him? According to Isaiah chapter 14, where did his pride lead him? Yeah, to exalt himself like God, okay? But I think it's even greater than that. Not just like God. There's a more of a sense that comes out in these verses. Above the stars of God. Above the stars of God is actually above the angels, and so he's already that position, but there's even more of that. So you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, where he's already there, like he's already dwelling in the presence of God. So this has significance, significance even above that position of the throne of God. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne, where? On high. I will sit on the, where is he going to sit? On the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, um, I will make myself, this last part, I will make myself like, What? Like the most high. Now notice, I will, the I will's in there. I will, I will, um, I will, I will. Do you get the, do you get the defiance and the, and, the, and the pride that just, that just oozes, out, oozes out of him? So what, um, so what do you think about Lucifer's actions? As you read about who Lucifer is, what he had, what he enjoyed in creation, now we begin reading. What, what comes to mind as you, as you read this, as you understand this? What things come to mind as you, as you think about Lucifer's actions? He's absolutely nuts. What else? What else comes to mind? Sorry? Yep. No dependence on God. I will, I will, I will. What else? Like, like, think about this. So, like, Lucifer had dwelt where? He dwelt around the throne of Almighty God. He stood, it says in Job, that he stood in worship of everything that God had created. He had seen God from nothing. The, 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 just complete black, 
backdrop, and then all of a sudden light sprung into source. Lucifer was sitting there watching that unfold in front of him. And Lucifer responded how? He responded with worship, with awe at the majesty and the power of God. And then the next breath, he comes out like this. And again, we don't know the time frames of when this took place, but think about it. Think of the audacity, the craziness, the stupidity to think that he could take the position of the one who created him. Yeah. In chapter 38, Job chapter 38, you can turn back there if you want, just before the book of Psalms. Chapter 38, and then in verse um, verse 4, and actually, yeah, verse 4. Oh, excuse me, no, verse 6 and 7, excuse me. Job chapter 38, verses 6 and 7. And so God is speaking to Job about creation. On what, on what were its bases, speaking of the earth, Bases sunk, and, and, and who laid its cornerstone? Obviously, God did. And then notice that when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so as we understand that, the angels were created prior to the creations of the, of the heavens and the earth, and they stood in worship of magn- and magnifying God for all that, that he was. Okay, so let's take a moment to compare Lucifer with God through this, through this chart. So God alone is able to teach us about everything. How about Lucifer? What did Lucifer need? He needed God. He needed God's help in every way at all times. Okay, God alone exists in the beginning, eternal, greater than all. How about Lucifer? Absolutely not. God alone is all powerful, existing by his own power, needing nothing. What did Lucifer need? He needed God, didn't he? God alone is spirit, ever present, all seeing all the time. Okay, Lucifer is a spirit, but he's unlike God. He's limited and blind in comparison to God. God alone is one, yet Trinity. Lucifer was nothing like God in that regard. God alone is all knowing, nothing is ever hidden from him. Lucifer, what's Lucifer? In comparison, he is what? He's limited and he's blind in comparison to God. God alone is absolute final ruler over all his creator. Lucifer, who did he exist for? He existed for God and whose wishes? His wishes alone. Um, um, Going down, God alone is absolutely holy, always acting perfectly. Lucifer is anything like God? No, he's unlike God in that regard. God alone is orderly, purposeful, and faithful in all he does. Lucifer, again, he's unlike God. Again, God is always loving, Lucifer not. God alone is the source and the sustainer and the owner of life. Now think about that. Lucifer had life because of why? Because God, God alone. God alone is merciful and gracious. God alone uh, defends his honor. God alone is supreme, won't give his glory to another. Lucifer was under the absolute authority of God alone. Like put this in perspective to understand the majesty. So who's greater? Who's greater? God is. And now this created being is doing what? I will, I will, I will set myself up above the heights of the one who's all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolute. The audacity, the audacity of him. Did Lucifer know the difference between himself and God? Did, did, is this, was this just, God, oh, oh Lucifer's just surprised at thinking of this? Or did he know these things? Yeah, he knew these things, but why, 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 where did the blindness come from? His, the pride of his own heart. And where did the pride come from? We'll get there in a, in a bit. Did God have any part in Lucifer's sin? Did God have any part in Lucifer's sin? Why, why do we say no? You guys are shaking your head. Why not? How can we know that? Because God is perfect. God is orderly. He's, he's purposeful. And um, where's, our, where's our thing here? He's always, he, God is holy. God is absolutely holy, always acting perfectly. He cannot be a part of that. Therefore, all of Lucifer's sin from start to finish was his own doing. Now, I believe, now I believe that Lucifer would have overheard God's warning to Adam that if he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he, that he would die. I believe that Lucifer would have overheard that. And as such, I believe that this, was a, this had been a warning to Lucifer as well. So Lucifer forgot who he was and arrogantly felt that he, that he and his owner had switched places, i.e. Lucifer was absolute owner and ruler, all-powerful and all-knowing. Like, think of the audacity of it. In his heart attitude was this, God, you are not good. I don't need you. Lord God, uh, God I'm able to overthrow the one who created me and take his place. Um, I exist by my own strength and wisdom. No one will rule over me or tell me what to do. I alone have the final say over everything in my life. 
That was his heart attitude. Lucifer is the originator and the very definition of pride. So when Lucifer lifted himself up in pride and rejected God, God viewed this as sin against himself. But what is sin? God viewed this as, 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 as against him, as sin against him. But what is sin? What is sin? How do we, how do we need to define it? We need to define our terms. What is sin? Act of disobedience? Yeah, what else? What is sin? Rejecting God. Yes, what else? Rebellion against God. Yes. So I like to define it. Uh, let's just define it here. Sin is anything that rejects God, i.e. his character, his word, his will, and his way. Sin dishonors, sin dishonors God. And so we need to define it and put it out there. Lucifer sinned the very moment these prideful words were out of his mouth, right? So as soon as Lucifer said, you said in your heart, or, so I will ascend to heaven, I will, is that, is that when he sinned? Yes? At what point did Lucifer sin? When the, words, when the words came out of his mouth? When he thought it, because it said, you said in your, notice what it says there, you said in your heart. And so the judgment happened when that first, when that first happened in, in his heart. Take, take your Bibles and turn over to James chapter 1. And um, again, not to take my words for it, but right almost at the end of your Bible, James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Have you got it? Can somebody read that for me, please? Okay, so what led Lucifer to sin? According to James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, what, what led Lucifer to sin? His own, his own desires. Now, some are going to struggle how a perfect being could sin like this, but we need to remember that God didn't create evil. He instilled within Lucifer the choice to obey or to reject. And that, by that virtue of that choice, evil was a possibility, and Lucifer chose that possibility. That's the end of, that's all that I understand from the truth of God's word, that Lucifer made the choice. God didn't originate evil, but the choice was there, instilled within Lucifer to make that choice, and he chose. And as he chose to reject God, then that's, the result was, was, was the evil, that desire. And again, the process that happened, again, the Bible doesn't teach us, it doesn't say it, but it's through the own evil desires that came and, and it resulted in that. It also says in Revelations chapter 12, 3 and 4, that a third of the angels followed Lucifer in his rebellion. They swore allegiance to Lucifer to follow, to follow after, after Lucifer. Now let me just pause this thing. So as when, we talk about it, when we talk about a third, okay, so let's just, let's just draw a circle here. So you got a third here. So here's a third of the angels that followed after Lucifer. So this put God in a box, right? This put God in a, in a quandary. Oh no, what am I going to do? No, absolutely, absolutely not. Because who is God? God is all-powerful. This didn't set him back. This didn't, this didn't set him into a quandary. quandary. Amazing that Lucifer and his followers who witnessed God's creation and lived in the presence of God would choose to sin against God. How crazy is that? How crazy that a creative being will lift his head up in pride and shake his fist at Almighty God and say, I'm going to take your place. And just the absolute defiance. So as you stop and think about this, how does, how does this account of the origination of, of, of evil and, and Lucifer, what does that, what, there's some things within our culture that struggles with that, that's contrary, that clash with that. So how does this account of the origin of sin clash with our culture? What does our culture teach us? Is it line up with what God's word teaches? What does our culture teach? What, is our, what have we been taught? You have to be the best, yes, okay, in that regard, okay? But think about, the orig think about evil, think about sin, as it were, in the origin of sin, and this account, the God's word, of how sin came in to the world. How does our culture, does our culture line up with that truth, or does it clash with that? 
Okay, it, it teaches God allowed it. Okay, so how does that line up with an, the, the nature and the character of God? How does this belief line up with the character of God? Does it line up? Does it magnify God or what does it do? It demeans him because who is God? God is absolutely holy. And so this is, this is contrary to his nature, and his, there's, his, his nature and his character. What other, what other beliefs are there about the origin of sin? Yes. And by, by virtue of that, they're saying there's no choice, there's no responsibility in that. And so as we understand God's word from Lucifer, Lucifer sinned against his owner by, what did he do? He rejected God as his ruler. And so there's that, there's that, there's that personal responsibility. How about this one? There is no such thing as evil. Okay? There's no such thing as evil. Is that a belief that's out there? Yeah, I'm not responsible. How about, uh, how about uh, Lucifer was created evil? Any other beliefs like that about the origin, the origin of sin? Yes. Lucifer, always there. No, you always there, but in that sense, that balance, that balance, of, that balance of, of good and evil. And how does that line up with God's word? It doesn't. And so what do we need to do? What do we need to do with, what do we need to do with these? Trash them because they don't line up with, with God's word and with what else? More important than even his word, his character. And so we need, to, we, need to, we need to destroy it. So if we believe those contrary beliefs, then who are we siding with? If we choose to believe the contrary, well, who are we siding with? With Lucifer. With Lucifer. And where did Lucifer get in, 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 in standing against God? Yes. Therefore, let's destroy these beliefs and let's, let's rest on God's word. Um, Lucifer sinned against his owner by rejecting his rule. Let's go to number two. God alone stands as supreme. He will never, he'll never give his glory to, it, to another. So let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 28 again. Ezekiel chapter 28. Again, not to take my words for it, but um, God's word. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 15 to 17, one more time. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 15. Somebody read that, please. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. The right unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you out as a profane thing from the mouth of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the fire stone, stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. So how did, how did God respond to Lucifer's rebellion? How did he respond? He cast him, he cast him out. And, and notice, some, notice some of the words that are used. I cast you as a profane thing. I destroyed you. Um, um, I exposed you. I cast you to the ground. Like this was no small undertaking, just the, the, the sheer uh, uh, magnitude of this. Remember in Isaiah 42, 8, it says, I am the Lord, there is, that is my name. My glory I will not give to another. So what does it mean that God, uh, mean that he, when, he, when God states that I am the Lord? What does that mean again? It says, it was Isaiah 40, it says, I am the Lord. What does that mean again? He is, remember the definition? What's the definition of Lord, all capitalized, all capitals? The self-existent God and without beginning and without end. And so what does it mean when he states I, um, what does it mean then when he declares he will not give his glory to another? 
I am the Lord, I will, I, and that is my name, my glory I give to no other. What does that mean, I give my glory to no other? What does that mean? He has a sole authority, yeah, absolutely. What else? He's not gonna give up his throne. He's not gonna give up his position. But so that the truth is, he stands as, he stands as supreme above all. He, he will never allow anyone or anything to take his position i.e. to replace him in his position as absolute as the one true God. Let's read further into the truth that God alone is supreme and won't share his glory with another. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. All right at the end of the Bible, right the, almost right over to the other side of the cover. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Just give a moment for people to find it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. You got it? Verse 13 says, um, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom he must give account. So how do we know that God wasn't surprised um, by Lucifer and his followers' rebellion? How do we know that God wasn't surprised by that? Yes, no creature, what's the same verse in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13? And no creature is what? Hidden from his sight, but all are what? Are naked and ex exposed before, before his eyes. He knows all things that are exposed and naked before him. Um, how else is God supreme so as to prevent anyone from taking his place? How else is God supreme? He is all power, he is, he is what? He's all powerful, isn't he? He sees all. He is everywhere. He's everywhere present at one time. He's the one who created the angels. He's the one who created Lucifer and all that they, and all that they were. Where could Lucifer hide in order to hatch this plan? What corner of the universe could Lucifer go and hide himself to come up with this plan? Because God is everywhere, God is everywhere present at one time, isn't he? And we've been, we've been seeing that through the truth. God was everywhere, knew exactly what he was going to do, even before Lucifer entertained the first, flaw, the first thought. The sheer stupidity of a, of a creative being thinking that he could ever replace the position of the one who is above all. We've been amazed repeatedly just how God stands completely alone and above all is supreme. He will not give his position to another as he would cease to be supreme. As a result, he judges all and stands in opposition, that stands in opposition to him. So let's stop, and, let's stop and think and bring this in and to understanding. So many people, it's already come up, so many people think that the, the battle between God and Lucifer is almost like this picture here. They're almost kind of, they're kind of, almost kind of equal where God's kind of got the little bit of the upper edge and he's always got to be on his toes because, he, because Lucifer is kind of almost equal to him. Is this the picture of who Lucifer is in, in, in proportion to God? Absolutely, absolutely not. And, but it, okay, look at this particular picture. And so if you look at this picture, this point on the thing here, here's a little speck under the sword of God, and here's Lucifer raising his fist, raising his fist up at God, and what's coming down at him from, 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 from space, as it were, this sword. Even this doesn't do absolute uh, justice to the whole thing either, does it? God is so much more powerful than Lucifer is. So how does our culture defy the truth that God will not give his glory or his position to another? Does our culture struggle with this? How does our, how does our culture struggle that God will not give his glory to another? What is our culture striving for? Yeah, we, make, we all make our own truth. Um, it's all about me. What else? How else does our culture struggle that God will not give his glory to another? Instant answers. And if we don't get them, then what's our response? What's our response if we don't get instant answers? Is there any similarity? What else? How else does our, how else does our culture struggle with the truth that God will not give his glory to another? Anything else? Sorry? We, we want it ourselves? 
I did it all by my elf. Say that again. Ah, accuse God of being selfish. Yeah, you come down. Okay, so let's let's take let's take these let's take these statements and let's line them up over here. Okay, so how do the, so this statements here? Um, I uh, we can we make our own truth. It's all about it's all about me. I am God. Instant answers. Um, we want uh, we want it ourselves. We accuse God of being selfish. Does it line up with humility or with pride? Pride, because it says, God, you are not good. I don't need you. I'm able to do it myself. I'm able to overthrow the one who created me, take his place. I exist by my own strength and wisdom. No one will rule over me. No one will tell me what to do. I alone have the final say over everything, over everything in my life. So how does this line up with the character of God? Will God share his glory with another? And so in defiance, in humility, we need to, we need to discard this and, re, and, and, and affirm that God alone stands as supreme. He will never give his glory to another, that he's, he's that absolute. Number three, God, is, God in his absolute holiness is furious with all sin, so much so that every sinner will be punished, punished forever. So let's jump into this. In Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17, what did God promise would happen to Adam if he, ate, if he chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What did God promise Adam if he chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What would happen to him? He would die. In other words, what's the other words for that? Not only die and die, but expand, uh, expand on the meaning of that. He would be? He would be separated from God, his, his, sor- his source of life, wouldn't it? Um, why would God, why, why would Adam be separated from God if he, disobeyed, if he disobeyed God in this way? Because he would be choosing independence from God, wouldn't he? He would say, I, I don't need God. I can do it myself. I want to be God of my own life. I want to do it. I want to know good and evil for myself, not relying on God in every way. If Adam sinned, would God be unreasonable in punishing him with eternal separation from him? If Adam chose to disobey God and eat of the tree of the life, a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, excuse me, and be, he would be separated from God eternally, eternally physically, spiritually, and uh, forever from God, is, would God be unreasonable if he did that and responded in that way? Why not? Why would God not be unreasonable in punishing Adam in that particular way? It's pretty harsh. It's just one apple. It's just one fruit for heaven's sake. Why, why the severity of it? It's not the act of eating the fruit, it's the choice, the heart, it's the heart matter. He's decided that he is better than God or that he doesn't need God to help him anymore. So he's lifting. So it's the heart attitude. It's not so much the eating. It's the defiance of it. And so even that separation, think about it, even think about, think about God, God's holiness. God is absolutely holy. And so if Adam defied it, if, God, if Adam chose to defy God, uh, God's holiness would, would demand separation, eternal separation, because God cannot be in the presence of sin or defiance. But there's also another part of it. In that separation, God would be honoring Adam's choice. How so? That eternal separation from God would actually be God honoring Adam's choice in eating. How so? He gave us free choice. How else? How would God be honoring Adam's choice? Yeah, the choice. And so, and Adam would actually be saying, God, I don't want you. I want to live independent. And God would say, okay, if that's how you choose to live, there, there's the consequences, there's the result, and the consequences that would come as a result of it. I believe that this warning also applied to Lucifer and his demons, and as such, they were, without, they were without excuse as well. Go over to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the last book in the Bible, and let's just look at the, another explanation of this whole event as it un- unfolded. Revelation, chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Can somebody read that for me, please? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, and the ancient serpent 
called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Okay, so what did God do to Lucifer and his followers? We already said God did what? He cast them out, he cast them out of heaven. And, and this is a picture that I found actually a Lucifer being, how did, how did God, how was he cast out of heaven? I love this picture. This picture portrays, how, did, how, was, he, how was he thrown out? I like the idea he was punted out. He was punted out of heaven as it were. But in that, in that position as he was removed from heaven, what else took place? What else took place? As he was cast to earth, what else happened? A battle ensued, absolutely. And how did, how, did Lucifer, how did Lucifer make out in that battle? He didn't at all, did he? Even though he had, remember he had a third, he had a third of the, of the countless number of angels on his side. How did he do? He didn't do, he didn't do very well. Pri prior to this, what was Lucifer's position? He was the guardian angel. He had a position of authority. He had a position. And so as he was removed from heaven, what happened to that position? He was, remo he was removed from that. Now think about that. Think about, think about Isaiah chapter 13. I will, I will, I will. Now he's punted out of heaven. What took place with Lucifer as he was punted out of heaven? What the, like he, he had lifted himself up in pride, didn't he? He lifted up, and, like, I'm going to take God's position. As God cast him out of heaven, what happened to Lucifer? He lost his position, but think even beyond that. Think of the shame. Think of, think of the dishonor that took place as he was cast out. He had the highest position around the throne of God, and he was cast out and cast to utter shame out, out from the presence, out from the presence of God. Was Lucifer able to make good on his promises? Absolutely not. How do you think they suddenly felt? How do you think Lucifer felt? Foolish? Angry? Vengeful? Defeated? Humiliated? <laughs> make, make a big mistake? God changed Lucifer's name to Satan, or the devil, the enemy of God. And so you see a Satan, and God changed uh, his followers, to evil, their name to evil spirits or demons. God is furious with all sin as it, because it dishonors him. As a result, let's re read what awaits Lucifer and his angels and turn over to Matthew uh, chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So what did God prepare for Satan and his demons? What did God prepare for them? Fire. What kind of fire? Eter eternal fire. The lake, the lake, of, the lake of fire that, that went on forever and forever. Why would God refer to Satan and his demons as being cursed? Why would God refer to Satan and his demons as being cursed? So he placed himself under and defied God. Now we don't typically in our culture, we don't talk about cursing. Our culture doesn't really deal in that, in that aspect of it, but there's an anger that's associated. When a person has been dishonored, the response, the response is anger. Uh, the, God's anger was poured out on this created being who had the audacity to lift himself up in defiance. God's honor was at stake, as it were, and God's response was with anger, with cursing. The hand of God and his punishment was, was on it. It was also the aspect of God's holiness. These are are now his enemies and so that cursing that happened is active it's present that goes with it and so think about that so being cursed by God is that something tri to be trifled with when the when 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 God and all of his majesty and his, his glory the one who's all powerful the one who's everywhere present the one who's absolutely holy when he calls them cursed what kind of position does that place them in Like think about, think about their position as being under God's curse, under that judgment, under that, that, uh, that punishment of God. The position would be actually even lower than the animals that were <clears throat> created. Yeah, even worse. Yeah, they weren't cursed. 
Are Satan and his demons in the lake of fire right now? According to Matthew chapter 41, or 25 verse 41. Are they in the lake of fire right now? What does it say in verse 41? It says, for the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels that's still in the future at this point. Um, they were, they're not in the lake of fire. They're now on earth. Let's continue to read just what his eternal curse will look like that awaits Satan and his demons in Matthew chapter 13, verses 49 and 15, uh, 50. Matthew chapter 13. Verses 49 and 50. Could somebody read those two verses, please? So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why do you think there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in the lake of fire? Why will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth in the lake of fire? It would be so horrible. What else? Say that again. That, yeah, forever. That separation from God forever. What else? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What else? There'll still be anger and cursing God. Yes. What else? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. There'll be a lot of regret. Why do you think so? Well, if they, if the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the for Satan and for his demons, there, it's beyond that. But there is that weeping and that gnashing of teeth. There's that regret, that hope. Think of that sheer hopelessness. Like there's, there's just the complete absence of hope. And it's going to go on for eternity. Like think, if we're going to take toothpicks to mark eternity in the lake of fire, how many toothpicks, how many toothpicks to mark the years? Think of the sheer hopelessness and the anguish that goes, that goes with it, uh, the torment and the anguish. Mark chapter 9 verse 48 also says that in the lake of fire, the maggots or the worms will never die and the, the fire will never go out. Then in Revelations 20, verse 10, it also says that Satan and his demons will be tormented day and night forever and ever in the lake of burning sulfur. The lake of fire is the punishment for their sin against God and his honor. There will be no rest, no partying, but rather excruciating eternal torment and separation from God. How do you think Lucifer and his demons should feel being cursed by God in this way? How should they feel? being cursed by God in this way. Do you think Lucifer and his demons, whether on earth, do they knew about the existence of the lake of fire? Absolutely. They knew what was to come. They should respond in just absolute fear, shouldn't they? It's a very sobering thought for what waits Lucifer and his demons who dishonor God's holiness and position. God's wrath against all sin will last forever and forever in the lake of fire. God is that absolutely holy. Amazing. I believe that Adam and Eve in their perfect state would have heard about the war that took place in heaven and felt the fear as it entered into their perfect world. What should this have caused Adam and Eve to do? They lived in that perfect environment. All of a sudden, evil came into their environment. How, what, how should they have responded to it? They should have run to God. Wow, how else should they have responded? At this point, they're in a perfect environment, aren't they? What choice awaited them? What choice stood in front of them in the center of the garden? The tree of life and the tree of? Knowledge of good and evil. Should it have, should it have been a warning to them? A, a shot across their bow? Hey guys, look out. Disobedience against God. Look what it results in. Nobody can fight against God and win. God is not to be, tri God is not to be trifled with. Here's a question. Why do you think God wants us to know about Lucifer's fall today? So we wouldn't do it, yes? Why else do you think God would want us to know about Lucifer's fall today? So look out for the deception that's, that's coming for us. Yeah? Anything else? Consequences of sin. Yes. 
Nobody can set himself up against God and win. But shouldn't it also stop to cause us in just sheer wonder and the sheer majesty of who God is in all of his, all of his majesty and his glory? Like the, the sheer holiness and the sheer majesty of who God is, shouldn't that cause us to, to, hop, to be humbled before him? And shouldn't it cause us to, to fear and to, and to uh, at, at who he is? It also lets us know that God is the person of his word. And that those who think that uh, God is too loving to cast sinners into hell, uh, we have a prime example here that God does carry out his word and will carry out his word. Yep, absolutely. He carries, he carries out his word. Think of, think of this. Think of those who stand in pride, who say, God, you are not good. I don't need you. I'm able to overthrow the one who created me and take his place. I exist by my own strength and wisdom. No one will rule over me or tell me what to do. I alone have the final say over everything in my life. How does God respond to that? How does God respond to that? In the case of humans, he has provided, I'm just getting ahead a little bit, but he provided a way of, of getting back to him. Yeah. And it would appear, at least to what I understand, that the spirits do not have that option. No, they did, the, spirits didn't have, the spirits don't have that option. But just even the sheer wonder, the sheer holiness of God and how he would respond to that in the sense of, of his anger and, uh, and, and, and those who would live in independence, which desire to live independence from him. So, in response to your question, why would God want us to see what yes. he forgive? Yes. It would show us that we need to take that second chance that we get. It. Yeah, absolutely. And he's not to be trifled with in that regard. And so you're right, you're jumping ahead. Okay, so this also brings, this also brings us down to something that Dan touched on. There's also, this, this brings us into, into a place where, there's, where we're faced with contradictions about the lake of fire. What contradictions are we faced with in our culture about the lake of fire? That it's a party. No fear. It doesn't exist. What else? How could a loving God send someone to hell? Anything else? Yeah, mother of hell. <coughs> That's not exactly the way. But I think you know what I mean. Yeah, and you're jumping ahead a little bit on that part, but you're right. There's a there's a sense where it's 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 small, like it's uh, uh, not as serious. It's not as serious as what God as what God portrays it. And so as we look at these as we look at these beliefs, how do they line up with God's word? How do they line up with God's character and His holiness? And his response, his right response to defiance against him. Does this uphold his honor or does it demean him? It demeans him. So what do we need to do? We need to destroy. Because God, is, God in his absolute holiness is furious with all sin so much that every sinner will be punished forever and forever. In conclusion, God's word has revealed a huge piece of the puzzle that's confused us for so long. I.e., who is Satan and where sin has come from? And so it's sobering to understand Lucifer sinned against his owner by rejecting his rule. God alone stands as supreme. He will never give his glory to another. God in his absolute holiness is furious with all sin, so much that every sinner will be punished forever.